Data site is where the world's biggest deals are made. One secure platform for M&A and beyond, giving you the confidence to run the highest value transactions, the technology to achieve more with less, and all the assistance you need. Run projects seamlessly through connected apps, powered by the AI that knows M&A for investment banks, law firms, private equity, and corporates. The deal is done at DataSite. Welcome to today's Harvard Business Review Analytics Services webinar, answering the Generative AI Skills Challenge. I'm Todd Prezan, Senior Editor for Research and Special Projects. I want to thank all of you for joining us today, and I want to thank Datasite for making this webinar possible. It seems like suddenly generative AI is everywhere. We've already been applying this powerful type of artificial intelligence to a wide range of tasks, creating art and design, accelerating code development, writing high-performing copy, helping to accelerate deal-making processes throughout the M&A journey. But do we really know how to handle Gen AI? In a recent global survey by Harvard Business Review Analytics Services, 85% of respondents said they expect their organization's use of Gen AI to increase in the next year. But almost half said their companies lack the skills and knowledge they need to use it fully. In today's webinar, Dr. Beth Tracton Bishop, who is research director of HBR Analytic Services, will share insights from this timely survey. She'll then be joining Nigel Kennings, who is CEO of Intelligent Voice, and Chad Burton, who is Chief Operating Officer of Investment Banking at Piper Sandler. They'll be talking about how Gen AI is changing the workplace, concerns about training, talent, and the workforce, and why companies need to act on Gen AI now. As a reminder, we are live and this is an interactive webinar. So if you have questions or comments at any time, just type your question into the Q&A chat box. And if you prefer that we ask your question anonymously, please let us know that. If you need help at any time, just click on the white question mark help icon. This webinar is being recorded. Nigel, Chad, thank you so much for being with us today. And Beth, thank you. Um, Beth, I'd like to start with you. Could you tell us a little bit about the purpose of this research? Absolutely. Thank you, Todd. Um, I'm delighted to be here today, and I'd also like to thank Datasite for sponsoring this webinar. Gen AI is front and center these days, and our research team recently conducted a survey on how organizations are using or considering this technology that's gaining, as you said, a lot of use and popularity. So let me just start out talking a little bit about what we did. Um, in November 2023, we surveyed um, 500 members of the HBR audience who are familiar with their organization's use of generative AI and are involved in decision making about how it, how it is or isn't being used. As you can see on our screen, we had respondents from around the world, from a variety of organizational sizes, functions, industries, and most are in the executive and senior levels of management. So let me give you a little, little foreshadowing of where we're headed today in, in my sharing of the information from the survey. First, as you were mentioning, Todd, 85% um, of our survey respondents expect their organization's use of generative AI to increase in the next year. Yet, especially among those who are not currently using Gen AI, almost half say it's the lack of talent with the necessary skills or knowledge that's a barrier to adopting it. And even among those organizations who are using Gen AI, our survey respondents at 26% don't currently offer any training on it. This tells us that the use of generative AI is expected to grow substantially, but that organizations are trying to figure out how to harness that power. A lack of skills or knowledge on gener generative mm -hmm. AI and a lack of training speaks to an opportunity ahead for many organizations as they strategize how best to implement this emerging technology. So since we mentioned that the use of generative AI, generative AI is meant to increase, where are we today? And we found in our survey that 76% of our respondents said that their organization is either using, piloting, or exploring generative AI, generative AI for business purposes. And among them, only 6% who say their organization has implemented generative AI in many areas of the business. This leaves about 24% of our respondents saying their organization is not currently using or considering the use of Gen AI. While history shows the full potential of so many technologies take years and decades ahead to be realized, 
There are many today who theorize that Gen AI's impact on business may be quicker and simply a few years away. This may be why, as, we, as we've reiterated, that many of our respondents predict more widespread use of Gen AI even in the next year to come. As I mentioned earlier, 85% expect their organization's use of Gen AI to increase in the next 12 months. Well, only time will tell. The expectations appear strong. With that expectation of widespread usage comes concurrent expectations about the impact the technology may have on the workplace and the workforce. 83% of our respondents expect a positive impact to their organization's processes. 74% expect a positive impact to their organization's customer experience. 73% expect a positive impact to their organization's business practices. It's not as, a clear, not as, as clear of a prediction of the impact to organizations, people, and culture. As organizations work to figure out how to implement such technology to facilitate their operations and their business growth, chances are it's not only about the technology itself, but the organizational culture's willingness to use the technology. As organizations consider and implement Gen AI, many are starting with specific functions. Currently, among our respondents, the areas cited the most where Gen AI is being used include marketing, IT, product development, and operations. And many more expect at much higher rates that in the next year, their organization is considering using Gen AI, particularly in operations, customer service, IT, and marketing. As organizations weigh the opportunities and challenges of implementing Gen AI, which leaders are making that decision? Our survey found that among a list of 14 different roles, our respondents selected that the CEO, chairman, president, or an equivalent are making such a role as the top response with 64% citing that. While 54% say C-level IT executives are doing so. While well, it's been posited that there may be a gap in what's known about employees' knowledge and readiness for Gen AI, as decisions are being made, are employees and teams ready? Our research shows that some employees and teams are more ready than others. 61% of our respondents agree that their organization's digital and tech teams are more are knowledgeable about Gen AI, but only about 39% agree that the general employees are. This suggests ample opportunity for training and upskilling staff on how to use Gen AI. And some employees have more opportunities to use Gen AI on the job as they go. Our respondents told us that some organizations allow employees the use of Gen AI for work purposes more than others. For example, 44% of our respondents tell us that their organization has approved the use of Gen AI for work purposes, whether they encourage the use of the tool or not. 35% encourage it, 10% don't. And many others are still deciding, it's about 26% of our respondents said for their organization, whether to use this technology. And others, another 26%, say that that position has not been communicated to their staff. Perhaps it's because this technology and its many uses are still evolving. So let's pause for a moment and go back to the 24% of organizations who are not currently using Gen AI and ask ourselves, why not? The top reasons that were given for more than a list of a dozen choices include a lack of talent with necessary skills or knowledge, data privacy concerns, and that the leadership doesn't see the use of Gen AI as critical at this time, among others, other options that you can see on your screen. So is it about the technology? Or is it decisions being made or the skills and knowledge present among employees? If it's, about the, if it's about the skills, then organizations training their staff to use Gen AI speaks to opportunity. Currently, among organizations using Gen AI, our respondents said that there's 26% who do not currently offer such training. This is a key finding that our respondents indicated this lack of talent with, with skills or knowledge about Gen AI as a challenge that their organization faces. But of those who do offer training, and there are many who do, the most common responses of who's responsible for such training is it's often shared across roles or teams, there's internal training and skills development teams, or cross-functional teams or committees specifically dedicated to Gen AI training. Perhaps then as organizations look to fit this type of training into their existing model, or perhaps they're looking to build a new one. 
Either way, many organizations are looking to train and upskill existing talent as a way to, to staff their generative AI initiatives. And among those organizations using or exploring Gen AI, 43% are training and upskilling existing talent, and 18% are hiring full-time roles with full-time roles with the necessary skills and experience. Yet 32% say their organization has not made any updates to support these initiatives. As the job descriptions that many employees have for their current role don't reference Gen AI, this is a, this is a matter for organizations to consider as they onboard such technology. And while organizations are exploring the best way to implement Gen AI and train their teams, we can learn from those organizations who have already implemented Gen AI. We see that for those using Gen AI, 16% say the employees are more productive, 10% say it changes the nature of work itself, and 8% say there's been greater investment in skills development and training. But many more expect impacts to the workforce that haven't happened yet. For example, 69% expect employees to be more productive 66 expect ch changes to the nature of work itself, and 65% expect greater investment in skills and training. This may signify there's more training and upskilling yet to come for organizations. So where do organizations stand today? We found that while 67% agree that their organization's leadership encourages Gen AI initiatives, 47% agree that their organization is well positioned to adopt it. But for now, this is where the opportunity for training can come in, and perhaps, training and skills development can help organizations be positioned for the adoption of Gen AI going forward. And with that, let me turn this back to Todd for the panel discussion about Gen AI and the skills challenge. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, uh, before I let you go, just very quickly, was there anything that you turned up in the data that surprised you, anything that stood out? Thanks, Todd. Um, the question about the expected impacts was really quite fascinating. And the idea that the impacts were fairly low right now, but were, were going to increase over time. It was, there, there was a much longer list and other, other aspects that followed that same pattern where employees working faster, employees quality of work improving, and employees jobs being more interesting and creative. I, I really will be intrigued to see what comes to fruition in the future. It will be intriguing, uh, Beth, you, uh, Beth, thank you very much. And Nigel Cannings, I, I want to start with you um, with, with a question about Gen AI. How important do you feel Gen AI is going to be to, to your organization, Intelligent Voice, uh, or for your clients' organizations over the next uh, two to five years? Well, I mean, it's, it's going to be revolutionary. I mean, we, and we're seeing now, I mean, it was quite interesting that Beth talking about 24% of companies not using Gen AI at the moment. I bet they are because it's a shadow IT problem at the moment. Um, what you're finding in a lot of organizations is employees are going on to chat GPT, they're drafting things in there. So even if the organization itself doesn't feel that it's using Gen AI, in many cases, its employees already are. And we're going to see that ripple through um, over the next couple of years. I do think that we have to be careful to split out the notion of Gen AI as a technology and Gen AI as a product. We, we, tend, we tend to kind of interchange them. You know, chat GPT is a product, but Gen AI is a technology. And, and where I think Gen AI is really gonna start to come in is not individual organizations trying to implement Gen AI as a technology. What we're gonna see is solution providers who are embedding Gen AI into their own products. And so that's where organizations are really going to engage with it, whether they know it's there or not. I think the issue is that when an organization itself tries to implement this, it's a bit like um, trying to run your own database. I mean, it, it's, it, you wouldn't want to do that in many cases. Um, and because of some of the ethical and privacy concerns that we have with organizations trying to implement their own AI, I can actually see Maybe we'll have a lot doing it in the next two years, but actually in five years' time, the majority of it's actually going to be coming in through third-party solution providers who are experts in the field. N Nigel, thank you. Um, uh, and I, I have a question for, for Chad Burton. Um, Chad, how do you see AI and Gen AI uh, changing the deal-making process in the next uh, two to five years? What, what changes are you seeing at Piper Sandler or elsewhere? Thank you, Todd. And I'd like to start by saying, 
I'm, we feel the same issues that Nigel's experiencing that, again, the shadow programs and, and what's happening behind the scenes. But from an investment bank, financial services company, we have very locked down strict parameters around data privacy, um, NDAs around client data. So we're, we're approaching it internally very carefully. We have been building out some large language models and other machine learning algorithms to, to, to help codify some of the data and, and do analyses. But what we have found easiest is to partner externally with third-party providers, Datasite being a great example. So where I see changes, I see changes in the large language model. So the written code, so whether that's drawing from an internal um, data, a codified data source, so all pitch books, all emails, all kind of written information that is segmented by whether it's industry or product, I see that being a very important piece to start. Second piece is data. Data is massive and getting bigger all the time. So we've partnered with a third party that's helping us to load, use the processing power that's in the cloud and, and really generatively start understanding and, and seeing patterns in the data sets. So those are key items. So data site is a great example from intelligence of creating buyers lists using the outreach tool. So what we're seeing is both an efficiency, adding potential buyers that may be unknown to us at the time or augmenting the list we already have. And then as we go out to clients, so these become a seamless process between cur curating the list and the outreach. You know, we, we've already seen the reduction of the, kind of that human error of attaching the wrong documentation to the wrong email and different things. So. We see a lot of things coming. I think we also see that as these large language models improve, you know, the amount of time spent in presentations, whether it's the pitch itself, whether it's the the sim process, is that if they can start drawing from internal sources, help write it, that's going to be a huge step. But we also see that part of that is also, I think error checking will be a big part of it as well. So you can start as you go through that banking process, see that there's going to be clear opportunities to, to really improve and, and create efficiencies. And as we think about efficiencies, is it 10 or 20% now and you know, and, and what, how that changes the employee workforce? We don't know, but I think the, the initial efficiencies will end up in giving us opportunities to do more and do efficiently in, in banking, create work-life balance, which is always a number one goal. Okay, thanks, Chad. Um, uh, Nigel, what uh, what are the top concerns facing the workforce today with the, the growing adoption of Gen AI tools? Well, well, I think we're we're going to face an expertise problem going forward because um, what we're seeing is that Gen AI is fantastic at dealing with routine, mundane type of tasks. So we're going to see it employed much more in in call centers, in chatbots, in you know, doing a whole range of, of tasks, you know, doing um, kind of contract reviews for due diligence, all of this type of stuff, you know, summarization. And, and that's going to be fantastically useful and done at a wide scale. But how are we going to train the experts of tomorrow? Because we still need human beings at the top who ultimately can answer the hard questions. And I always think about this in, in the contact center space, but it, it applies to lawyers, it applies to accountancy, it applies everywhere. Um, you know, the, the person who answers that hardest question in the call center is actually the person who started one day on the phone asking very, answering very routine questions. Um, in the same way, I was, I was a lawyer before I was a technologist and I learned my craft by reading other people's contracts and, you know, doing small bits of drafting. Eventually I became good at what I did. If we've replaced all of that with machines, how are we going to train experts in the future? And, and for me, that's the number one problem that companies are going to face if they de-skill using Gen AI. I'd like to see Gen AI coexist and be used as something which augments current processes rather than replacing them. But I think too many companies are looking at replacing rather than augmenting. I, I want to ask a, a related question um, that came in from uh, one of our attendees, Damien Lamas, who is asking, is, is there evidence of roles um, being replaced by Gen AI assisted processes? Um, does, uh, do, do, you, do you have a view on how that might evolve? Um, 
Well, Maybe I'll start with Nigel and go go to Chad for that. Yeah, I mean, I at the moment what we're seeing is is mainly augmentation. So um, what we're seeing is that people are doing things more quickly. So again, a call center example, when you finish a call in a call center, you have to type a whole load of notes up about what happened in that call. Well, you can now use Gen AI to wrap what's called a wrap up bot, which basically does that for you. It listens into the call, it summarizes it, it puts all the actions in it, it does it. So that's augmentation. Um, so we're certainly not seeing replacement yet but as I said, I can definitely see um, organizations thinking at least that they can lean in that direction. Um, I think it's a very dangerous direction to, to go in personally, but um, you know, that, that's, what we, that's certainly what we're seeing, not people being replaced, but maybe Chad seeing something different to me. Nigel, that's a, that's a great lead in, and we feel the same way about that loss of knowledge and expertise. And so we've been working with our training vendor to start developing the skill set. And I think first of it, it starts with that certification of experience, right? What do you know on accounting? What do you know in finance? And, and if you don't have a baseline, you're a liberal arts major. And, and so we build that out so that we feel like we have, you know, a real kind of something we can work from. With that said, we could see, you know, that evolution of experience going from execution, Excel to really abstract and creative. So. We started a training class of 120 people on Monday. And as we started talking about technology and where we're at within our journey at, at Piper Sandler, the one thing I said is like, well, how many people, question of the group, how many people have used ChatGPT or some other you know experience to write papers, get questions answered, and hands all shot up. And, and so it's universally across the board. So I think I always say things happen for a reason. I, I think their knowledge and experience they're gaining is, is teaching them what are the prompts I need to ask? How do I get through these data sets and manage this as we go forward? On the flip side of that, and, and you know, do we see changes in, in the numbers of people or whatever? I, I think it'd be silly for us to not anticipate some of that. You know, Again, I think the first level of efficiencies is just do more, do better, get better balance. But I think as you go into the next, you know, that's probably the first kind of couple three, but the next kind of three to you know, infinity beyond that is it, the, the efficiencies really, really start to change and accelerate it. And we saw this somewhat with outsourcing, you know, to, to various locales, certain repetitive skills, you know, that in that, all right, pull this comp group, create this, you know, create this uh, company profile. It's like, that stuff is easy. That's the stuff you can see being, re, you know, the large language models easily replacing and, and moving quickly. The biggest issues, data we get tons of data files in Excel, CSV, whatever the whatever the forms are, that's the stuff that's hard. And that's why we started partnering with external sources to, to really say, okay, how do we load this? How do we use that processing power that's in the cloud? Because data sets are getting bigger. I'm not sure if that's, you know, again, the, the analysis, the analytics behind the scenes, that's the piece that the evolution is like, how do you draw out those KPIs of what's important to you, to your client, and the message you're giving to your clients? Chad, thank you. I, I want to ask you a question that came in from uh, from one of our attendees, uh, Lucas Richter, who's asking which which phases of uh, of an M and A transaction uh, do you expect AI, uh, AI or Gen AI to have the the, the most uh, have the biggest impact? And just to piggyback off that, maybe making the question a little broader, uh, which areas are you using Gen AI for or other AI or machine learning in your role? All right, so from the, from the banking side, I think the biggest, the biggest changes are gonna be in the written, is the starting is gonna be in the writing, right? How quickly you can put and assemble data, do research internally. We have a lot of repeat business within investment banking. So how do we position this last time to go through and pull the last two pitches, three SIMs, whatever it happens to be, and, and really start quickly doing that. Also incorporating not only the internal data sets, but external. Okay, what else is new? What else don't we know since the last time this was written? That's one. Two, I think the as these data sets get bigger, as we you know develop better AI to really generatively understand is this revenue, is this expense, is this, you know, how does this fit within the, you know, the 
the full um, body of work is, is that that analysis can be drawn out a lot quicker. Where we're using, say the name, I guess, Blue Ops Diligent the most, we've already seen that loading of data sets have gone from kind of a couple, three weeks, I mean, massive data sets to something that can be done in 20% or even less of the time required to, to use either Excel or Tableau. So those those loading mechanisms, that ability to, to sense and cleanse and manage those data sets is, has really saved a lot of efficiency. Thanks, we have a few more questions, but not just like in my role specifically and or directly within the bank, you know, this is the day to day. We shut down ChatGPT internally, um, you know, because of security risk. Again, I mentioned at the very beginning is the ability to know what's going back and forth across the pipeline. You know, what is out in the, you know, in the public sphere of, of knowledge and information. So we're, we're, we're carefully approaching it, but we've got a fantastic IT team that is looking at it, that is, you know, getting close to deploying Piper GPT or some version of, of OpenAI. So we're, we're definitely working on it. It's definitely important. And I think the democratization of data is gonna be really key to what can we go back, clearly defining it and, and managing it. And I think I heard Nigel mention it earlier, we're not trying to manage the whole internet, right? We wanna be able to manage what we have and then work with our main market data service providers or whoever the, you know, the group is at the time to come, you know, bring all of that together to, to do better analysis, to better KPIs, to get better vision of where we think we're headed. Chad, thank you. We, we have time for a couple more minutes. Uh, we have a couple more minutes for, for other questions, but I, I wanna make sure to, to ask one. Um, I wanna start with Nigel on this one. Um, and this is from, um, from one of our attendees, Nanand, uh, Nanandi Subramanya, who's asking um, if there's, there's you know, there's concern about uh, about AI taking over roles, but what what kinds of, of brand new jobs do you see um, do you, do you expect to see resulting from uh, you know the ascendance of Gen AI into the workplace? What what kinds of new jobs do you see coming along? Well, we're already seeing the the growth of the chief AI officer in a lot of organizations. So we're going to have a lot of things over the next kind of few years, which you've got you know we're going to be AI washing a lot of jobs here. Um, and so, but, but there are, you know, I think that we're going to actually start to see things like, um, you know, AI ethics boards, which are staffed with people who are expert in, in those areas. So I actually think a lot of the, um, we're going to see reskilling in security and, and Chad touched on this as well in ethics. Uh, but also, you know, people who are going to be modeling things like the energy usage, for example. So, you know, I, I'm actually thinking that the ESG is going to suddenly start to play a really big role in organizations where they're saying, hang on a second, you know, we're using this stuff and we've just, you know, we've just burnt down a rainforest with all of the, uh, the work that we've done. So I think there's going to be a lot of kind of adjacent jobs to um, what's happening with AI. I'm not, you know, I'm not necessarily sure in five years time, though, that we're going to have a huge number of jobs which have still got AI in the title. They'll get folded back in to existing roles. The chief AI role will get come back under the CIO or under the the CTO. Um, but you know, maybe maybe Chad's got some thoughts on a on a few new roles that might be coming out. You know, at this point in time, I grew up. But I going way back. I'm a CP by training, and the the advent of the computers didn't diminish the number of analysts, right? So there's there's not analysts, accountants, there's still accountants running all over the place, internal auditors. So again, it's an evolution of what are you doing with your time? Where are you focused and where are you headed? I, I think a quote I heard from somebody as I was thinking about technology and where we're going is that chat GPT or AI won't take your job. The person that knows how to run it will, right? So you, you gotta think about how do I improve? How do I get training? How do I manage? And everyone, again, that we're working with is thinking along that continuum of increasing the knowledge and development. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm gonna ask one lightning round question to Nigel. Um, why do companies need to act on Gen AI right now? And what should they actually be doing to prepare their workforces for, for the capabilities it brings in? Um, well, they should, I mean, everyone should be looking at it 
um, to see how they can streamline their business processes now. But they should be doing it with a very jaundiced and weather eye. Um, Chad's kind of hit on a whole load of the issues around security and ethics and data privacy. So what they should really be doing is training people. I'd be training them on the dangers of Gen AI at the moment. That's where I'd start and work backwards from there. And as I said, look at using third party service providers who've thought through all these problems themselves and understand the questions you should be asking of your providers. You know, is this stuff ethical? Um, you know, what's the security model around it? You know, what's happening to my data? All this type of stuff. So I think we train people to be um, kind of skeptical of it and ask the right questions. That's what I'd be doing right now. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, we could keep talking about this for an hour, I'm sure, but unfortunately, uh, we're out of time. It's been a great conversation. Uh, Nigel, Chad, and Beth, uh, thank you so much for being with us today. And thanks to everybody for joining us um, on this webinar. Uh, thanks especially to Nigel Cannings from Intelligent Voice and Chad Burton from Piper Sandler. And thanks also to Dr. Beth Tracton Bishop from HBR Analytics Services. Our producer at HBR today is Samantha Berry. Thanks to her and to our partners at On24, and a big thanks to Datasite for making this discussion possible. This concludes our presentation. Have a great day.